listening to the Top Music Guitar Podcast, the show for guitar teachers to learn about the craft of teaching great guitar lessons that students love. If you're looking to start or expand your studio and make guitar teaching your full-time dream job, you've come to the right place. Each week, you'll get to hear from some of the top guitar teachers from around the globe and get their best tips and experiences so that you too can build your own dream studio. I'm your host, Michael, and I've founded one of the top guitar schools in Australia, written a best-selling curriculum, and I mentor guitar teachers. I'm excited to share my expertise with you and the wisdom of all the experts we interview. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Let's get into it. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Top Music Guitar Teachers podcast. As always, I've got a real treat for you today, and our special guest is somebody who has had over a decade experience as a guitar teacher, originally born in England, brought up uh, in Boston. He's a Berklee College of Music graduate, and he's a software developer as well, someone who's gone from the teaching world, figured out a couple of problems and things that are missing, and decided to take matters into his own hands. So let's welcome Sam Reddy from Musi.live to the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. Sam, it's great to have you. Hi, thank you so much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always great meeting new people, and I always tell people I have the absolute best job in the world interviewing people for this podcast, and I'm glad you could make it today. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's a pretty awesome job, to, especially when you think about all the opportunities from you know music teachers and what you can do. You know, Being able to follow your passion is pretty much the goal, right? 100%. And the fact that I get to connect with other people all around the world who are passionate about teaching or music in general or ways of making the whole learning experience even better is absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And um, I've, I've known about you for a while, as I had mentioned earlier. I have a few friends that are using the Guitar Ninjas courses. And uh, so it's cool to be able to kind of for us to finally connect because I feel like there's a lot of people that, you know, doing kind of what we're doing, you know, different projects in the music industry. Um, and it's, it's really nice to finally be able to put a face to a name and, and make the conversation happen. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, we've been on each other's radars for a while and it's glad to, glad to be able to make it finally happen. And the whole theme of the podcast is basically finding expert teachers or people who are doing extraordinary things in the music education world and then trying to take their knowledge and their ideas or to share their products and services and what they're doing to help further musical education and share it with some of our listeners who are on their own journey and want to do better than the previous generation of teachers or have a much bigger impact on their current students and students in future generations to come. So we've obviously had a quick chat before jumping on the podcast, but can you give our listeners a brief overview of your story so far, your journey as a music teacher to now a tech entrepreneur who's created a platform for online lessons? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, it's been a a weird journey. It's not where I expected to be, I think, as most people who, you know, were the bedroom guitar players, uh, you, you thought you were going to be a famous musician, right? <laughs> so when those realities get dashed, what else are you going to do? But I, I grew up in a musical family. When I moved to the States, I was about three years old when we moved out here. So I grew up mostly uh, just outside of Boston. And my dad had been a professional drummer in the 80s and a software developer after that. So when we, uh, as a kid, I, every day after school, he worked from home. So I would come home from school and then he would just be at home, have the drum set ready to go. And he'd be down there jamming out. So I'd grab the guitar and we'd just play. So basically had like a, a little band session every single day after school from probably like 12 years old till I went to college. So that, that was how I really learned. I took lessons and everything like that. And my teachers were fantastic. But then when I went off to Berkeley, uh, that's where everything, well, you know, rise, falls. It was a lot of uh, <laughs> choosing different paths and trying to figure it all out. When when I got there, I thought I was going to be a music producer, you know, play in a band, record some albums, you know, the, the rock star lifestyle, right? <laughs> and um, it worked out a little bit at first. We I had a band and um, we went, uh, we did some, you know, festivals around the country. We got invited to go play the Progressive Nation at Sea, which was a festival hosted by the drummer from Dream Theater, Mike Portnoy. So that was my growing up, that area of music was like my thing. So it was, it was, that was like the highlight of my music career in the performance space was getting to go out to a cruise ship, spend a couple of weeks uh, playing on a festival and everything. And then once that kind of fizzled out, you know, as bands do, 
uh, I, I had to figure out something else. And so at college, I decided to move over into a, uh, a sort of a new major that was a, it's a pro music degree, which basically just means that you can sort of create uh, a focus in something specific that you're interested in. And it doesn't have to be something predefined. So mine was education technology. So I took a couple of classes at Berkeley and I joined the startup lab. And while I was at the startup lab, that's where we started coming up with, with all this stuff. And the very, very original version of this was a practice app for college students. So the idea was that you could get on the platform, you could put in all the things you needed to work on for your assignments and like everything in the semester, and it'd build practice routines for you that could go, you know, 16 weeks long so that you had sort of an idea of everything you need to be focusing on. Um, it was a pretty cool concept and the college took it on as uh, like the first customer to, to use it and everything. And we had some really cool opportunities like Victor Wooten uh, was one of the like first people to try it out because he just happened to be in um, in the presentation day. So in class, you would present every every other week or something. And it was my turn to present. And Victor Wooten happened to be the guest speaker that day. So I got to present my product to him and he thought it was a great idea. And then that's how it got folded into the, the university. So Berkeley used it for a bit. And then that kind of evolved into a much bigger product. It, it took over sort of more of a, a full lesson suite. So it was more like managing your studio, billing, invoicing, scheduling, files, uh, practice logs, pretty much anything you could imagine for, for managing lessons. And it did have a video portal, uh, not a very good one, but <laughs> it did have one. And we ran that product until 2019. Um, and it was in about 2019 that we'd been tinkering with a couple of different ideas. And we had this idea for a tutoring service. And the intent was originally going to be that you're, you would go on as a student, mostly college students, and you'd request a teacher for 10, 15 minutes, and it was pay by the minute. So the intent was that you'd actually be able to go on and have this unique lesson experience there was really short, snippy little lessons, but tailored to exactly what you might need. And so that was the original concept. But as we started building that out, uh, that was all 2019. And then to, uh, January 10th, 2020 is when Musi finally rolled out. And so for a week or two, we had some teachers online doing you know, the, the tutoring stuff and it was okay. Uh, and then we had a flood of teachers coming in who were all panicking about trying to find a place to teach online. So we added the ability for you to add your own students to the platform. And fortunately, that was a really simple change because all we needed to do was change the accounts from randomizing who you met on the platform to just connecting you specifically to somebody. So that was really lucky for us. That, that was just, you know, we just happened to make that work. And then um, it kind of kept going from there. And ever since 2020, obviously, the pandemic sort of spurred teachers online, but uh, it's just been growing ever since. So I can't really complain, although it's not exactly the way you'd expect to start your business off. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully you were able to capitalize in on the fact that everyone had to get online quick <laughs> and make that transition into the online world. Absolutely. Yeah, that was our that was the luckiest thing. I mean, I can't really take much credit for any of that. That was really just a good timing situation for us. We had the because we had built all the online technology for the tutoring service. We knew that we were doing online music lessons. So we'd spent an entire year building out all the tech and making sure the infrastructure would work and the high quality audio and all that kind of stuff. So so that was all good to go. And then we were, you know, we were doing a few tutoring sessions here and there, nothing special. And then all of a sudden it was, you know, a couple hundred teachers signed up and we're like, wait, what? <laughs> and then fortunately we were able to pivot because um, we're, we're a smaller company. So, you know, that's a nice advantage. You can just quickly swing the ship and we switched the account types around so that you just connected with your teachers. And yeah, we just kind of kept going from there. And now we just released our newest version of Musi that came out about a month ago. So uh, for the last three years, we've just been sort of learning and building. And now we have a new sort of cohesive package that the whole thing's sort of contained in. That's awesome. And obviously the definition of success in my books, because people often talk about being lucky, but it's literally being prepared for the opportunity. If you've done the groundwork, you've done the hard yards, and then of course the opportunity comes along and you're ready for it and you're successful, you know, that it's not luck. It's obviously by design, <laughs> being ready for the yeah, right yeah, 
I think that is fair. At the end of the day, yeah, the preparation and opportunity, right? When preparation and opportunity meet, that's luck. And I think that is fair because, you know, as, as you know, even like the music stuff, like I, when I played in a band in college, we got to, we uh, submitted our song to this competition. And out of 400 bands, we were one of like 10 or 15 that got selected. And, you know, that it felt like the luckiest thing on earth. But, you know, the reality of it was five guys who spent, decades you know or basically like 10 15 years of their 18 year life practicing instruments you know so that uh that they could get there so yeah i i think that's a, a fair definition 100 percent, and yeah uh, there's often a lot of jealousy in local band scenes and music worlds and like that but most people again don't realize that the people that end up making it through are generally the ones who are the most organized and yeah maybe 30, 40 years ago, if you had a bit of talent, you could get by with being unorganized simply because it was a whole different landscape. But even then, like you could be unorganized, but you still had to put your decade of hard work into it to becoming an overnight success who just managed right. to do it at the right place at the right time or who put themselves in the right place at the right time. But I, I think if a lot of people realize the amount of effort that goes into being organized, preparing your set list, writing music, the practice you do for years and years. Uh, and then, of course, you might be in the right venue at the right time out of the 100 different venues in your hometown to be discovered. Not that these kind of stories happen that much anymore <laughs> anyway. Sure. Right. Uh, you know, were you in the right venue? Was that lucky? Yeah, but you, you put a lot of hard work to get you to that place. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think, and I love the over, the overnight success one. That one makes me laugh because that's, the the ten year overnight success was the is the joke right you know it's it, it just it's always like hey I even the Grammys always kind of give me a laugh when they're like artist like new artist of the year Beyonce you're like what <laughs> you're like I think she's pretty famous already <laughs> you, you know so it's yeah it's it's definitely interesting yeah well I definitely want to talk more about music but I just want to tap into little things along the way. Uh, in your journey, because you said a few interesting things. And the fact that you were able to jam every day or almost every day after school with your father, who was obviously a professional caliber musician, how impactful do you think that was on your development? And how do you, important do you think, uh, from a teacher's perspective, it is to have your students playing with other people? Oh, I've, yeah, uh, 100 billion percent. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 that is the most important factor to how I got to where I got to. And as a student, it is the most vital thing. I mean, having backing tracks and things like that are great, but if you, a metronome, of course, everyone's best friend, but I really never needed to use a metronome. I had a human metronome that was made much more interesting beats than click, 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 right? So, and that, that was where you learn. I mean, we would, we got to the point pretty early on where we never even, you never say anything. We'd just sit down, plug in, no words spoken and go. And then you just play. There is no, we had these like songs that we kind of like knew what the framework was going to be. And we'd play a bit of that. And my dad would like call out, he'd be like, play that riff that kind of sounds like Black Sabbath. And I'm like, oh, you mean this one? <laughs> and like, he's like, yeah. And then we just jam on that for a bit. Or, and we played for hours every day. I, he worked from home. So he, and he usually was doing his own businesses. So he had the flexibility to, to be there which was pretty awesome for me. So I, we had the whole basement set up. It was funny. My mom was like, no drum set in the house, too loud. So we got a V drum, you know, the Roland electric drums. And this was like 20 something years ago. So like one of the old first ones they did. And then two 250 watt PA speakers. <laughs> so it was louder than any real drum set could ever be. Um, I am, you know, we had the basement set up and it, it became the jam room and it really was the fundamental uh, aspect of my musical development, especially like music, like stylistically. He was a heavy metal drummer. So his band toured with like Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden. And so when I got into, you know, when I was that age, it was my first guitar was like a Schecter. You know, I was, you know, the, my uh, my seven string is the main guitar that I use for for all my music that I wrote. So, you know, that definitely uh, heavily influenced my musical direction. But once I got to college and started meeting other teachers and stuff, then the horizon started definitely opened up. But yeah, in younger years, that was definitely it. Just so I'm a metalhead myself, so just curious as to what the name of his band was, if I'm going to 
if it's a popular. Oh yeah, yeah. It was a. Uh, it was called A to Z. So it's uh, A like one one or I I, and then Z. You know Z. Um, it was a British band, right? So they, uh, yeah, and they toured with uh, Sabbath and Maiden and. All those, uh, their buddies were like the Def Leppard guys, you know, all of the early new wave British heavy metal, they were signed to Polydor Records. Um, so they did the whole thing, had the record deal, went on tour, you know, 20,000 people, uh, arenas and all that stuff. Yeah. So as a kid, I mean, you kind of a little thing to live up to. The albums were on the wall, you know, and, and there was always that like mystique of, play like opening for black Sabbath or, you know, playing at this, you know, massive arena. And then yeah, I did my version of it. Definitely not to that caliber, but um, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. And I always say that one of the most important things for young musicians is to have supportive parents. So to have a father who is in the music industry, who's right into it and, you know, making sure you get the good gear and, and buying you really cool or helping out at least steering in the right direction. I won't assume that he bought everything for you, but helping you get some great gear straight off the bat just pays you in terms of the motivation. 100%. And actually, that, that actually is a – I think that's a really important thing that people overlook a lot because – and I think you'll relate to this one. It's very, I was talking this with someone else recently. It's very frustrating when a student will show up in a lesson with a new guitar and they're like, look, I got a new guitar. And you look at it as the teacher and you're like, oh, that's – definitely not the guitar you should have gotten like that's that's not right for you like you're a metalhead like you don't need a telecaster like you should have you know like you know you and i as teachers we kind of have this like hmm you know so as a kid the one thing i remember was my dad we went into guitar center back when guitar center was you know the big wall of guitars and amps and you know it, it really had had that vibe and we went in and tried out all the different guitars and he said, he's like, I'm not going to get you one of those starter pack guitars. And it's for my uh, like 12th birthday, I think. Um, and so he was like, I'll let you go in and pick out what you want and what you'd like to, you know, but we're not buying anything. We'll leave. And then maybe you maybe will get something for, for your birthday. So, um, but he said specifically, he did not want to get a cheap guitar because he felt that that would really dissuade you from engaging with it. And, and I think he was right. He got me the guitar, you know, it was a heavy, you know, heavy metal guitar, you know, not that's really a thing, but you know, it felt, it was called the Hellraiser, you know, and, it, and I got a crate amp that had a really good distortion sound on it. And for me, that was perfect. That's what I needed. Right. And so I think that was a massive influence on actually wanting to pursue it. And the other thing he did, which I think was another huge kick that uh, parents, could take a, a lesson from is he made me practice for a month without lessons to prove I would actually do it. So he gave me like a book and a DVD kind of thing and was like, okay, for one month, you have to show me that you're going to practice 30 minutes a day. If you can't even get to the end of the month, then we're not paying for lessons to, to, to do this. You know, probably music teachers, I don't want to hear that, but the, I think that's a fair assessment is if the student's not going to make it a month of practicing or at least even fiddling with the thing, you know, picking it up to explore it then it's probably going to be a little bit more difficult to get the lessons going. For me, that was the motivation to be like, all right, I need to do this. And I remember sitting down with my eyes closed and playing through C, G, and D for 30 minutes every day, just being like, I can do it with my eyes closed now. Like, I'm the coolest. And then going to my first guitar lesson finally and being like, I clearly don't know anything yet, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> yeah, oh, it was really interesting you say that. I think that's actually like a, a great test in terms of uh... – proving to your parents that you're worth the investment. I think that comes with a little bit more maturity. You wouldn't necessarily do that with a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old. But as uh, someone just going into high school who's just discovering the wonderful world of music and rock and roll and heavy metal, and probably you, you probably knew back then you wanted to have some sort of involvement in music beyond just a little bit of a hobby. Totally, totally. Yeah, it, it became, it was one of those things where like, I tried the drums for a day and, you know, my dad tried to teach me and that was yeah, we're like, ah, that's not going to work. And then, you know, I tried the piano for a day. I was like, yeah, I don't like that. Went to a music camp, tried the violin, tried the, you know, tried one of everything for a day. And then I was like, I think it's going to be guitar. And, you know, I'd always liked guitar players and everything. And, you know, my dad was always a fan of music. So, you know, we'd listen to like Joe Satriani and Steve Vai and Petrucci and Paul Gilbert and all of those shredders were often rotated in the house. So I was well aware of that. And as a kid, we went to concerts galore that was our thing as 
you know, most, if you go like hunting trips or biking trips or whatever, you know, camping or for me and my dad, it was concerts. So I remember once in middle school, I was probably about 11. No, I was probably about 13. And uh, <laughs> we, it was, yeah, it was about a year after I got my guitar, I think. And I went to four concerts in one week and I was go, I was like coming into school, like, like half awake. And the teacher's like, what are you doing? I was like, I saw Black Sabbath last night. <laughs> like, and then and I was like, but I've got to go see UFO next tomorrow night. So got to keep pushing. <laughs> and so, but I loved it. I mean, that I think was a big, big thing too. Like I saw so much live music as a kid that I just wanted to be on the stage. I now don't really like going to concerts because I'm kind of get like that feeling of like, man, I wish I was back on the stage. <laughs> but then it's, I just I'm like, I don't have the time or effort for that. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, really envious. Obviously you growing up in Australia, like you'd get back Black Sabbath come out like once every right, five once to every, ten yeah. years maybe. And right. um, there was actually this really one bizarre period in maybe I'm going to say it was like 2016, maybe 2017, where literally every heavy metal band, I think we went from having like one international show every three or four months to a whole bunch of bands all came within three weeks of each other. There was something like 20 metal gigs, like there were, and there was gigs on the same night, like three bands in town. It was absolutely crazy. I love it. And That's I was just awesome. like, yeah, maybe this is what it's like living in LA or or around about those like big American cities where there's always people in town. As you, as you can say, Boston was was like that. There was always uh, there. There was like three or four venues that were packed every night with with acts. The nice thing about where we would live too is because it's on the coast, we could get the international artists as well. So that was usually their first stop, if not New York. So we got pretty lucky with that kind of stuff. But you just reminded me real quick of, uh, we used to play with a, a band. Uh, have you ever heard of a band called 12 Foot Ninja? They're an Australian yeah. heavy metal band. They're a cool bunch um, of dudes. <laughs> Yeah, so I used to open for them whenever they'd come to Boston. That was my band would would be their opener, and they that was just, I love those guys. They just broke up, I think, but the yeah, they I listen to their music all the time. But they used to come over to Worcester, which is like a heavy metal venue just outside of Boston. There's this this Palladium, and uh, every time they came out, we would get a call and we'd get to go out and open for them. That was one of my favorite shows to play. Yeah. No, they have a very cool bunch of dudes. And fortunately, um, my friend, good friend Simo, I'll give Simo a shout out because I know he'd be listening and he's guested on this podcast. He used to work with, I think, at least one, if not two members of the band. So we'd always, and he used to throw some of the best parties. Uh, he was kind of like the, uh, when we were at university, Simo was always like three years older than the rest of us. He'd sort of come down from the country town to move to the big city and uh, make it as a musician. And he, so he sort of had the the wisdom. He, he was a bit of a head to the curb, knew how to throw the parties for us, like young 18, 19 year olds. And yes, he was in with the right guys within the Melbourne music scene and the 12 foot ninja were a part of that. So it was cool to meet those guys and just some of the, the party jams, some, you know, the guitar would bust out and you'd just be in awe of these guys ripping all this kind of stuff and you're like oh like they've gone from massive stage and world tours to jamming with you in a garage so it was really cool stuff. i know isn't it so strange that's like what college was like for us we had you know at berkeley there's that flow but i remember you go to so many basement shows and then you'd look around and you're like wait like i remember once going to a basement show and some of the professors were playing and some of our professors are like pretty well like joe stump is this shred metal guitar player that teaches at Berkeley and he'd just like show up and play. You'd be like, oh, okay, well that was pretty cool. <laughs> you know, or uh, Victor Wooten was around a lot. He'd he'd be but um no I know it's it's super cool being able to sort of get the grounded level of of the the reality. But isn't it, it's kind of funny, isn't it, that the it also breaks down like the uh the glorification of the of the band life, right? When you start to realize that it's not so much just stage hopping from big stages across the country there's a lot of downtime that is just playing in basements and jam with friends and doing all the in-between and everything i think that's the the uh rude awakening that a lot of musicians don't realize that is actually some of the best parts if you know personally but if you just want success and uh big stages that's not going to be the reality yeah and there's nothing wrong with the rock star dream. And I think with certain bands, you, you get to a point where you can't go back from big venues. And I think if you've ever read um, Motley Crue's book, The Dirt, there's this awesome chapter where he talks about the machine. He goes, the music industry puts you on one of four levels. 
but the only way you can go is up. As soon as you start that downward trajectory, it's only a matter of time before you you fall. And if you fall too many too quickly, you, you break up and, and things like that. But yeah, like a, a band like Black Sabbath, once you've gone to there, there's no going back. Yeah, like, there's there's no coming yeah. back down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fair. That's fair. So it's an interesting analogy, but I think for a lot of musicians, like they didn't necessarily always get into it, become rock stars, and maybe in these days of reality TV and X Factor and things like that, it's it's easy to go from obscurity to on television. Unfortunately, for some of these people, it's often straight back to obscurity again. Uh, at least it's here, like here in Australia. I don't know how the artists go in the US and some of the more global or countries with larger populations who run these TV shows, but often. Uh, one of the dreams that a lot of young musicians have is, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a famous singer. I'm going to be in a band. So I'm going to go on X Factor. I'm going to go on Australian Idol, American Idol and win the competition and then be famous. And yeah, maybe one person per season has a good two or three year run. I think the only long, long-term long stars we've got here in Australia are literally the the winner and the runner-up from season one. And maybe, right, that's, just, that's what I was just going to yeah. say. Yeah. Even like seasons two and three, those guys kind of pop up on TV every now and then, or maybe they do like a stage show. Uh, this, but they're still like sea level celebrities. Uh, but to to bring this to the point, I was going to make it for a lot of people who just wanted to play guitar because they love it. They never lose that passion of just going to a jam session or an open mic or performing in other people. Like the audience doesn't matter. And this kind of links to to my friend Simo again. Um, his cousin Scott used to live in Ireland. And then he ended up coming back uh, to Australia and he used to work as a, a barkeeper, uh, a bartender at this bar. And he goes, it'd be a mystery bag, but every now and then Gary Moore would just rock up for open mic night with like a, a Les Paul in a case and plug in, go, all right, boys, what are we jamming on tonight? And like, he goes, so there'd be a bunch of teenagers doing their blues number. And then Gary Moore would just jump up on stage with them and rip a blues or Every now and then Van Morrison would just like rock up and both of them guys, they just wanted to play. They just wanted to make music and they didn't necessarily have to want to go on like a 40 date tour to do that. I think you're right. There's the YouTube is another one of those, like the, like the reality shows where, or TikTok, right? Where it becomes a little toxic in the sense that a lot of people think, oh, well, I'll just make a bunch of videos of me shredding and I'll just play fast and then I'll get like signed or something. And it's like, that just doesn't happen anymore it just doesn't even the best youtuber guitar players like a handful of them are making a good living out of it but you know most of them are falling back on many other alternative businesses to keep the whole thing afloat and so i think that's sort of like you know and in in anything it's the you know the old reality of only a couple will pop off at the top but nowadays i think with the sort of dispersion of technology that you know students or whoever wants to become famous you might become famous but you'll become famous in like a pocket and if you can use that pocket to grow your thing then fantastic and if that's what you want to do then awesome and and things like patreon where you you know you literally have like a a small cluster of subscribers that are paying you for your album release or something like I see that a lot more now, especially with smaller artists and smaller creators. And I think that's a, a good thing. It just means that becoming a musician is kind of going back to the old like minstrel days where you actually get paid for the work you do. And uh, it's the, the small group of people who you run into that like your work, not so much massive stages and, you know, pop idol or anything like that. But I think the the nice thing is that there is always, in at least our lifetimes, there will always be an industry for people making music and people who want to see music live, buy music, listen to music. You know, I think that will always stay alive. It'll just constantly keep changing. So you got to be savvy. And thus, you know, if you're not, then like you said, if you're not prepared and organized, then you're not going to be one that gets to stay on with the, the changing times. Yeah. And it's indeed changing times. It's absolutely crazy. And here's some food for thought. Uh, do you know a guitar player called Steve Taranto? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. So this guy is like, uh, you know, uh, an Instagram knee shredder, absolutely amazing player. And all these people are like, wow, who is this guy? I think... Tosin Abasi's company sponsors him, you know, got a whole bunch of sponsors. He did, uh, I think last time I saw him, probably about 12 months ago, he opened for Pliny and that was his first show. Despite being five to seven years famous on Instagram, 
uh, a household name within the online shredder community. He'd only now just gone out on tour and done his first ever live show, which to me was absolutely like mind blowing, but it's just a completely different world these days. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I think I remember seeing some, I, maybe it was, it, it might've been the him as well, but I, I think I saw something similar of, of someone like that, a YouTuber who finally first show ever. And it was similar. Like you're like, but they've been around a long time. There's another guy, Drusif something. Um, he's another kind of YouTube guitar player. Tons of videos, big hits, you know, and some cool cover videos. And then sort of like first big show wasn't, you know, until, you know, t- five or six years after he started the online career. Um, and and it's never quite as, you know, it, it's like pl- opening for Pliny is fantastic. Like that's where you want to be. But you'd almost expect a there, – there's a – there's like a false expectation of how much success an online career can make you in the the real world, right? Like being able to open bef- for Pliny is is exactly the right move, but you probably wouldn't be able to go and headline your own show first, you know, first tour, right? You know, or at least not ninety percent of people, right? <laughs> um, but I think it is, like you said, it's kind of impressive now that I, I just like the idea that people have more outlets for how you can create your music. So obviously, like with online lessons, it kind of relates right back to that because if you have more access to learning how to create and you can create and distribute however you want, I think that's fantastic. I just think that it's important that, you know, the reality is also there of like, you know, sales of your songs is probably not going to be the thing that pays your rent. Um, You know, you're going to want to have the business brain of all the other things that go with it to actually make it into a career and not just a hobby. It, unless you want it to be a hobby, then awesome. There's no stress and you can do whatever you want. And that's what I do love, right? Is that if you don't want to be famous and you don't want to be a pro, which is 99% of people, they don't want to be famous or a professional. They just want to play because they like to play, or they just want to make some music. I, don't you love the idea now that your students can record themselves and put that on Spotify? And then, you know, like they can then go out and tell their friends they're, you know, they're on Spotify and you can go listen to it. And like that kind of thing, I think is really powerful as well. Um, so it's it's a double edged sword. Yeah, well, one hundred percent. Like literally, with three hundred to five hundred dollars worth of hardware and software and a laptop, you can literally put stuff out there that would have cost you a hundred thousand dollars to do twenty. 20 years ago, let alone 30, 40 years ago. And what you can create now on your own <laughs> is better than what someone with a lifetime worth of experience and half a million dollars of experience in a, in a million dollar studio could have done. Like It's unbelievable how much the barrier to entry has been reduced and how almost anyone can just go straight from the bedroom to sharing their music with the world. It's absolutely amazing. But the flip side of that is everyone else can do it. So once again, we're just back to right. being ultra close. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So and that, that's exactly it, right? Which, again, if you are just doing it for you, what a what a great way to get your music out to the world. But if you're doing it for commercial purposes, um, it's still the exact same competition. There's going to be the small percent who work really hard, who have great quality stuff, uh, who aren't just good musicians but are good marketers, are uh, actively connecting with the right people. It's always been that way. So in some ways, you know, the landscape has changed, but in other ways it's the same game just – on a different playing field. I, I completely agree. And and I relate that a lot to what we do with like the with having people teach online or what happened during the pandemic. For teachers, it's like you're still teaching. You're still just doing the same. You're still teaching music lessons. Like that part has not changed. Don't actually change how you teach. That, that that's what you were good at. Don't change that. We're just gonna change the application in how that curves is that's just and there's some buttons and knobs and things that we have to twist now to make it happen but you know it's still you teaching a lesson at the end of the day you know and like with us with our product you know we try our sort of philosophy is don't like to try to mimic it, what it was like to be in person what it's like to teach a real lesson and basically pretend that the video portal doesn't actually exist and that's just a a mechanism and the person's actually just sitting five feet away from you instead of right next to you. Yeah. It was really interesting you say that. And obviously having people reach out to me to say, Hey, how do I teach? It's just like, it's the exact same thing. You just have a screen between you. It's because uh, at Melbourne Guitar Academy, we primarily teach group lessons and we do group lessons of eight 
to 12 people uh, routinely uh, in, in our classes. And we were just like right before the, the pandemic hit in Australia, we sort of looked, go, mm, what, what's the best outcome here? What's the worst outcome? We think it's going to happen like this. So we just preemptively went online uh, a week or two before the formal kind of lockdown because people were kind of scared at the start. And we just said, hey, this is what we're going to do. And we'll reassess in two or three weeks and see what happens. So we just moved online and it was literally seamless. We went from teaching in person to teaching in Zoom pretty much instantly and nothing was different. If, if anything, we just, instead of doing groups of eight, I started doing groups of like 20 to 30 people <laughs> all at the same time. And, and it was just like, it, there was nothing different about it. And sure, some people who lost the human connection part of it and really looked forward to coming and hanging out in person, they were the kind of people that suffered the most. But the people who were serious about their guitar lessons or literally had nothing better to do actually really gravitated towards that. And for all the, the teachers who were just like, oh, I'm going to stop for three months or I don't want to use this or this isn't real teaching, the amount of music schools and guitar schools in the area who just stopped and shut down then their students are like, oh, I still want to learn. I don't need a teacher. So we ended up like losing 30% of our students and making back like tenfold of, of the students we lost because we were the only place still kind of like operating and, and pushing. So, yeah, for the people who aren't really embracing the technology, it's like whether you like it or not, the world has changed and you either embrace it and adapt or – you go away the, the way of the dinosaurs. And yes, there's always going to be a place for in-person teaching and there's always going to be people who prefer that. But you, the, the, the new normal, for lack of a better term, is this is how things are going to be. And full disclosure, I've, I've gone back to 99% in-person lessons, but we're still integrating a lot of the things from the technology and what we did the last two years have crept their way back into our, our regular in-person lessons. And you know, who knows what the future holds? We want to be ready so that if we do have to make this kind of move once again, we can take full advantage of it. Exactly, right? And that's where for Musi, we've taken a much different approach from pretty much any of the other things that are kind of out there. In, uh, in 2021, it became very apparent to me that this was just a two to three year thing that was going to be, the ch- it was going to be two to three years of like really bad. And then it was going to be a long haul of however, who knows, however long, possibly forever, of this new landscape, right? And and what I predicted, and fortunately, I think I got it right, was the prediction was hybrid lessons, was that you would offer some kind of online lesson because why not? And then you'd offer your in-person lessons because you should if you have the ability to. So if you can teach in person you will get a great experience teaching in person. But like you said, why not bring in the the things that you benefited from online? Like with Musi, we have an in-person lesson room. So when the student comes into class, you just fire up the in-person room and then you can record the lesson into the, and you can do either like a one full lesson recording or tons of little snippets. You have the interactive whiteboard, the assignments, the games, activities. So if you want to do anything digitally, like if you have a big TV or a display that you use content from, you can do it right from there. Or you just do your lesson in person, completely ignore the computers even there, just teach. And then at the end of the class, you just click done. It automatically sends those recordings off to the students. And then they have a copy of that for whenever they need it. And that's something that no one really offered previously, right? And honestly, now you think, like, once I started thinking about it, it's like, shouldn't every lesson be recorded? I mean, you're really paying for that. And, like, wouldn't you love to have all the recordings from all the lessons you ever took as a kid? It's, there's There's got to be a gold mine in there. So, you know, that was sort of the philosophy of how do we provide teachers and students with an environment that can facilitate learning? And it doesn't matter what the medium is. If you're online, if you're in person, if you're jumping back and forth every other week, if you're a group class, if you're a group class that's half in person and half online, and you might rotate back and forth every other week or something, cool. There, the it shouldn't matter. You should be able to just teach, and the the technology should be uh, there, but not uh, not invasive or not sort of uh, dictating anything. It should just be there to help. Yeah. Awesome. 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 I remember almost every single guitar lesson from the day I got an iPhone (laughs) to right up to now has been recorded on this, just like in an audio format. But the fact that you could just set up the computer, 
record. I'm assuming it's a video recording or is it an audio or a bit of both? Yeah, yes, video, video recordings. You can just hit record and then have that copy. Man, I would have loved that <laughs> growing up. And, and then you have, and with Musi, you have all like for students side of thing, there's all the practice features. So all the homework and assignments and everything is transferred through the portal. So if you're not using it for online lessons, it's still your assignment, your practice, your lesson management. And then the students go home and they can log in, they can use the interactive tools, or they can just print everything off. It doesn't matter, but they can track their practice progress through it. So students over time, like we have students who have practiced hundreds of hours and they'll, you know, over the last three years with Musi, they've been able to rack up hundreds, thousands of hours of, and so they can see all the practice they've ever done on every topic, on every assignment. And that's just going to keep going as, you know, as they move through life and eventually become teachers themselves, they'll hopefully, you know, then we've actually had that happen a few times, which was probably the coolest thing ever was a student became a teacher and then used Musi for their lessons. And that's, you know, that's the dream for us to have like the generational. So, you know, they valued it as a student and then they want to provide that value to their students. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's really cool to be able to use the technology uh, just to enhance the quality of lessons. That's really the goal of Musi. Um, if our motto is, if it helps you teach or it helps your students learn, then we're interested. And uh, that's a very, very important outlook. You've mentioned a few key features here, which all sound really awesome. Is there anything else that you're doing to separate yourself from some of the other platforms? Because there literally has been a boom in probably, are you, I think it's called like the the six monkey theory or the, the global monkey theory. Have you heard of that? No, not sure. So there's this theory that, so for example, on the island of Madagascar, the monkeys on that island figured out, oh, you know what? I can use a stick to get termites out the mound the same way the ones on the mainland did, the same way the ones in Asia did. So it might have taken 10,000 years of evolution, but roughly all around the same time independently, all these monkeys started doing the exact same behavior. Just they, they finally figured it out. And it's kind of like all these musicians had these problems with Zoom or Skype and go, oh, you know what would be better if I just made my own platform? So everyone sort of uh, coming up with solutions to problems. What sort of makes Musi stand out from some of the other platforms? Yeah, absolutely. The, I think the big thing is we've been doing this a lot longer than it's, we're not a response to the pandemic. That's a big difference. We've already seen a lot of those come and go that were the, oh, I'm just going to do something to help. And then they try, they try to turn it into a company and then it just fizzles out because they just spend too much money. And that's, we've seen it in numerous times. So that's the kind of thing where I'm not worried, you know, competitively with that kind of stuff. It's nice to see that people are trying, but I think most of the, those will figure out quickly that it takes a lot longer and it's a lot more expensive than you'd ever imagine to actually build something that works. The, a lot of people, you can grab some like free uh, WebRTC platforms and then you just slap a face on it and call it something special. That'll work for a little bit, but unless you're actually doing something special, um, you're not going to get very far. And the ones that have stuck around the, the whole time, I think, are the ones that are clearly doing something that is working. Our specialty, where we break from everybody else, obviously, audio is king, high quality, fidelity, you know, all of that stuff. That's about the same on all of these music platforms now. There's different little tweaks here and there, but there's, it, we're, we've, pretty much all tapped out what computers are capable or really what Wi-Fi is capable of right now. So that's really sort of at its limit. So where we focused is adding features that you kind of get around big problems like duets. So the first thing, obviously, you can't really play online in a full duet if your students don't have perfect fiber optic and you don't and you know you're not on good Mac Pros and all that stuff. So if you in most scenarios, you're not going to be able to play a duet. So with Musi, we have something called Clips, where the teacher records their part of the duet while you're in the middle of the lesson. You hit record and start playing. And when you're done, hit stop. It will immediately transfer that recording over to the student. The student can then hit record. They record along with the teacher's performance and then hit save. And then it merges those two together into one recording. And then when you hit play, it plays back as a duet. And it's two video files too, which is kind of fun. So you're like playing a duet with your, your teacher. Um, so those kinds of things allow you to simulate duets and still have the experience of playing along and not needing to worry about lag and things like that. But where Musi really separates is the student side of things. So there's a lot of platforms out there that offer just a high fidelity platform with a, a whiteboard and file sharing and some widgets here and there. 
The problem and the, the thing that most of them misunderstand is that if that's not in an organized system, then you're still leaving your students with the same old online problems of you get out of your Zoom lesson, you get out of your Skype lesson, and you just have files. They're either in Dropbox, Google Drive, they're emailed to you, texted to you. Teachers will record things on their phone, text it to you, and then you play along from your phone. And so things like that are decent workarounds. But if you can bring it all into one environment, it's much easier for students to manage. So they just come into the platform. The lesson fires up. If you want to do a duet, that tool's built right in. If you want to share files, it's built right in. And for the student, everything is accessible to them anytime from their account. So they don't need to worry about downloading things into different uh, devices or worrying about files and storing all these lesson recordings and all that kind of stuff. They just go to their account and they have access to all of their material. And then their account doubles as a practice room. So I've got metronomes, practice timers, all the everything the teacher has shared with them to work on. So we're more of um, it's more of both sides. And so the audio and stuff like we, we built that you know years ago now and have just been upgrading it as we go. But it's all the other tools that really enhance the quality of, of online lessons now. Um, and in-person lessons, because you can do things, like we were saying, that you couldn't do before. Yeah, and I think that's one of the key things is the fact that if you can make this uh, useful for not just the online learning, but something that bring into your practical exercises or is part of your studio in an integrated fashion, then you are providing something that you're not going to get from uh, some of the other platforms where their entire focus is online and then if you're no longer teaching online, what's the purpose of having this app now? Because it, it's now made redundant. Whereas if it's baked into the way you run things at your studio, then there's a long-term retention for you, but you're still providing value and utility out of the software. Absolutely. Yeah. We have dozens of teachers, hundreds of teachers that just use it for uh, in person. Never lump, They literally never go online. And that's fine. I, I personally don't really care what you do. You know, you teach however you want to teach. Uh, but it's a, at the end, at its core, it's a lesson management system. The online thing is just its sort of secret weapon. And so that's, you know, that, and that is just really good audio quality. It makes it really nice so that when you play together, you actually hear everything. It's not cutting out or phasing and all that kind of stuff. Um, but overall, it's, it's then those tools that make it enhanced. And, and yeah, the, the combination is where we move away from our competitors. And it's also because we've been doing this for so long. Musi has been growing consistently for three years now. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of music teachers out there that to still bring into the fold. But, you know, we're, we're in about, I don't know, 70 countries or something like that. And 80 countries of people that use the product. And so now it's just sort of taking on a life of its own, which is crazy to me because, you know, it started off with just me and my dad tinkering with some stuff. And then <laughs> before we knew it, they, this was kind of rolling into a, a monster. And uh, yeah, it's, it's we, like I said, we've been fortunate as, for sure. But um, I think the other thing too that makes us a little different is how our team works. A lot of companies misunderstand and think you can buy this kind of technology where I mean it, you can, but it's very, very expensive. You, if you don't have specialists who work in your company who know exactly how this kind of technology needs to be designed and built, you're going to have a really hard time actually executing. And that's really the, I think the biggest thing, like for us, we've had <laughs> the, the mistakes we've made are our first product, our second product that never got released, uh, Musi when it was just a tutoring platform. Uh, all of those I can, you know, are, are now big mistakes we made that have turned into sort of the opportunity of creating what we have now. We learned not what not to do. And now, we, especially with Musi 2.0, with the whole redesign and sort of rebirth of the product, this is, um, this is really the culmination of not just the three years here, but the almost decade of, of building and working with teachers and everything. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot behind it. Yeah. And I think you kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit earlier in just saying so many people creating these kind of platforms just severely underestimate how much goes into making something, let alone making something good and then making it so successful that it uh, is widely adopted by the broader community of your audience. So, you know, it, it, 
again, it's not about lucky and being in the right place at the right time. It's about investing so much into it, having the right team. Um, I was fortunate enough to have Eric Fons on here and he was just so passionate about um, his team and getting the right people and the experts in place and and gave me a really deep insight to the fact that it wasn't just something that happened by accident or something you figured out. He had to be so conscious about who he put around him to help make the dream or the vision come to life. And, and that's where I think a lot of people who do this kind of thing are going to, yes, they can have the great idea or we can all see a problem and come up with a solution, but seeing it through to its completion is a completely different matter. Absolutely. And, and the other part of, uh, of that is that uh, a lot of people who go, who like from my point of view, who came into the business, the tech world from not the tech side, right? Like I was the guitar player. I was went to Berkeley. Like I want music. I was teaching. Like that was my knowledge base. Getting into the tech world, like you said, if I didn't put like, fortunately, my cheat code is that my dad is one of the top level software developers that's alive. So that, that's just real. That's dumb luck. <laughs> that, that, that one I can't blame on it take for any credit. But the fact that he was a musician in the 80s, I was designing something that he is interested in. And then when we started working together, we were able to collaborate because like uh, you, we were talking about earlier, we spent every day collaborating together. We, we, we've worked, I'm, my dad and I own Musy still, like we're still the two owners of the company. And um, we, in my mind, we've owned our company since I got a guitar when I was 12. That company just went from writing songs to making software. And, you know, so for us, it's like, it's a pretty well-oiled machine. But the thing is you have to, once you start bringing in other people to the fold, you have to be so careful about who you bring in and how they are going to enhance your business, but it be able to do things that you can't do. It's one of those like, you know, you have to be a little self-aware to be able to say, like, I am a terrible writer. I'm an awful writer. I, I just, I can't hardly read. Like I, I just, it's not my strong suit at all. So that was one of those things. Like when we had the opportunity to get someone who was very good at writing and marketing and doing all like the emails and the pitch, like that, that kind of stuff. I was like, Let's do that because that's where I fall apart. I can't write. I can tell you what I'm thinking, but I can't write it down. So filling in those gaps is how you build the good team. Now, of course, most people, if you don't have the ability to just, you know, if you don't have people around you that want to work with you to make something happen, then unfortunately, you have to go and buy those people, which is where the problem usually relies. And that's where people go out and like, just go on Fiverr or go out and just find a, a, a tech firm in overseas. And they're just like, okay, but this is the app I want build it. And they give them $10,000 or something. And sure, you'll get the app back, but uh, it's not going to work very well. And there won't be much infrastructure sort of keeping it going. Where for us, our, I think what makes us different is our team, everybody specializes in something specific. And like I design the product, like I sit down every day in Photoshop and I design every element that you see on the screen by hand completely from scratch. And then that gets shipped over to the development team. They turn it into a real thing that gets pushed over to the t testing, which I do a lot of that too. But, you know, it go, kind of goes around and you have to, you know, make that work. And once you've got it cohesive, it's just kind of keep, just keep running with it and improve what you're doing. Um, but I think for us as a business, the biggest thing that makes us successful is just listening to our customers. We're almost too active in our like tech support and engagement with our community. It's a, but that's how you know what to build, and it's how you know where the company needs to go. So you know, as much as I make the final decisions on things, it's really the users and the teachers who are dictating where this is actually going to be going overall. Awesome! Really, really great stuff. Now, I've just got a couple more teaching questions uh, that hopefully our listeners can get some benefit from. And I'm sure many people are very keen to check out Musi if they're not already on there. And we'll talk about where you can do that in a few moments. But maybe a great insight. So someone who's sitting at the, the top who has all these music teachers asking for features or making recommendations, what are some of the cool or innovative things or out-of-the-box things you see teachers who work with you doing in their studios that, that would just be great ideas for other people to implement in their lessons? 
Yeah, the one thing I've seen in the last year that I think is the single smartest, well, there's there's two. The first is just doing group lessons. Uh, I think everybody should probably at least take a look at it. If it's not your thing, that's fine, but you should definitely take a look at it. It's, it's a lot more effective than I think many people realize, and I think it's a lot easier than a lot of teachers might realize. Um, not saying it's easy, but it's not as daunting as, um, as it's intended. So, Doing group teaching is something I think all teachers should at least take a look at. The thing technologically or this kind of out of left field, though, is this is a little specific to Musi, but it kind of generalizes across the board. With one of our tools, you can record little snippets of the lesson as you go. And so what we've seen is teachers are going through their lessons and they're recording just themselves talking through little like lecture points. So they might start talking about major scales. So they'll hit record and they'll do a little lecture about major scales and then they'll stop, save that recording. And then the halfway the next part of the lesson, they're talking about something else, record that, save it. Student gets a copy of course, because why not? But what they're doing is they're downloading those videos and they're turning them into courses. So they're going into like Kajabi or even like YouTube, or you can kind of do it in Musi if you wanted to. Um, but something like Kajabi is much more like built for it where they're actually building out complete courses of how they teach. And it's like an introductory to my uh, teaching school or, and it'll be like, you know, a hundred dollar course that's all of these modules that were created while they were teaching. So they're not wasting any extra time after class trying to do like a scripted lesson. You're getting the natural actual engagement from the teacher. And you can't hear the other students in the recordings, so you don't even know that that's how they recorded it. It just comes across much more engaging. I, I, I thought I was absolutely brilliant because it's sort of killing two birds with one stone. You're already recording the content, so you may as well repurpose it. And then using that for like ads on YouTube and Facebook ads and like YouTube promo videos and things like that. Uh, we've seen a whole bunch of that kind of stuff too. So even if you're not using our stuff, you could still record your lessons and chop those up into uh, you know, actionable things. Yeah, that, that is a very, very handy feature. And someone who would record a 60 minute lesson and then have to go back and cut up, look at timestamps or look at where the audio is to see where I'm talking or not. And, and then chop out a whole bunch of stuff, which almost takes as long as <laughs> the actual lesson itself. That seems like a really cool feature. I think you dropped out a bit. So I'll just quickly summarize the basic first thing that you said was doing group lessons, which yeah, you should definitely be doing group lessons. Anyone who listens to this podcast definitely knows I'm a big advocate for that. And if you need help guys, shameless plug, we've obviously got the Guitar Ninjas program, which is totally geared for group teaching. It works equally well with private teaching, but if you aren't teaching group lessons from a business perspective, you are severely hurting your, yourself, your ability to make money, and you are also limiting the development of your students. Going back to how we started this podcast, one of the biggest benefits to you was the fact that you could jam with someone every day after school. If you're in group lessons, you don't want to have students wait three or four years to get good enough at guitar to jam with people. You want to use jamming with people as the the match day. There's no point you know, going to football training every day after school and then never playing a game. It'd be totally pointless. So go straight to playing the game and learn as you go. And, and the second point you made was the fact that this little recording feature basically saves you time by allowing you to Set, record and save video snippets, which is going to cut out a whole bunch of editing time and allow you to create assets on the go, which uh, in this day and age, it's all about leverage and can rather than have a side hustle, which you have to invest 20 hours a week into, if it's two hours investment because you've saved 18 hours through this technology, then that's going to allow you to reinvest the other 18 hours into marketing or going and getting more students or whatever it happens to be. So, that seems like, uh, again, an amazingly powerful use of technology. Yeah, and I think that's one of those things when you start to use your technology for not directly what it was intended for, but finding a couple of interesting use cases. And, and you know, it's that whole passive income. If you can create a course from something you were already doing, and then that course can make money and you don't have to do anything with it other than just post it on your website and maybe do a little promo then sort of no skin off your back. Like, why wouldn't you, right? It's like, it's almost free money hanging there. Um, so, and, and it opens you up to a whole new opportunity as far as how you teach. You could get in, you could dive into the whole course creation world and that may become your thing. You, you never know. Um, so it's, it's never, you know, it's always worth exploring. Now, Sam, my last question for today, 
second last question because we're going to ask you where we can connect with you and find more about you right before we wrap it up. But if you could part, impart one final piece of information or wisdom on our listeners for the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast, what would that be? Absolutely. Yeah, I I think really it's I, I used to give the the wisdom, the like cliche one I used to always give was the uh, sort of just keep your head down and keep moving forward. But that was through the pandemic. But now we're out we're, we're out the other side. Fortunately, that doesn't have to be the wisdom anymore. It can be uh, a bit more lighthearted. But I, I think like we were saying at the beginning is my intent, everything we do, everything you do is to create more people who enjoy music. So if you have any interest in pursuing music, do it as a hobby, as a profession, as a favorite pastime, as something you do once a year, it, it will, it'll be worth it no matter how much you invest into it. So don't stop yourself. That's some fantastic advice. And of course, the actual last question, where can our listeners find you online, connect with you, check out Musi? Where can we connect? Yeah. So Musi.live is our website. That's got all of the the good stuff kind of on the front end. Uh, but if anyone is a teacher and they are actually interested in in learning more, we have a Facebook group called Musy Teachers, and we all just kind of hang out in there and post memes and talk to each other and just just uh, pass around ideas and all that kind of stuff. So uh, if if you would like to join our community, you're more than welcome. And uh, yeah, and if you feel like you're interested in using Musy. You can book a demo and I do the demos personally live. So I meet you on the platform, show you around. So if you're interested, just let us know. We're happy to help. Sam, thank you so much for coming on the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast today. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. We'll definitely hope our listeners go and check out Musi or at least go in the Facebook group and say hello and obviously connect with Sam and everyone else. And guys, there's been some really cool things. The reality is the world is changing and the more you can embrace technology and start using it to leverage what you're doing to have more of an impact on your students and to help people have more fun playing guitar, get more out of their lessons and of course, make life easier for you, the better. So thank you so much for tuning in to another episode and we'll see you guys on the next podcast. Thanks very much. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, including a free ebook on how to find more guitar students, visit us at www.topmusic.co slash guitar or check out the show notes. And lastly, thanks again for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.